Want to start the recording? All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Harnessing the Power of Student Feedback webinar. My name is Brandon Gaynor. I'm the Acting Director of Professional Development with CBC OEI at One, and I am pleased to introduce to you our wonderful facilitator and colleague of mine, Jasmine Phillips. So a bit about her background, she's got quite a varied one. She's been an adjunct, as many of us have been here, but she's also full-time at Compton College, where she has been part of, she has been the DE coordinator, and I believe instructional designer as well. But now you're back in a primarily faculty role now, right, Jasmine? Anyway, during this webinar, we'll also be linking to a survey for you all to provide feedback, and we'll be dropping that link in chat about every 30 minutes and then 15 minutes after that. So you don't have to fill it out, obviously, right in the middle of the webinar, but it will help to have that window open just so that you can go back to it. We ask that you fill it out to let us know how we did so that we can create programming that's more tailored to the needs of the system in the future moving forward. And lastly, while At One does offer badges for the for our facilitated courses as proof of completion, we don't provide a badge for attending this webinar. However, I realize that some of you might be here for flex credit, so that if your institution does need proof of attendance for flex credit, professional advancement, or other such things, we ask that again you remain to the end of the webinar, complete the survey, but most importantly, at the very bottom of the survey, there's a function to say, get a copy of my responses. Please check that, and that should serve as proof of attendance for the webinar. If you need something more than that, there's the support at cbc.edu, but that seems to have been sufficient for a lot of colleges so far. In any case, we're going to turn it over to Jasmine and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. All right, let me share my screen here and I'm gonna move this down, get this out of the way and there we go, share. All right, so today we have an interesting topic uh, titled Harnessing the Power of Student Feedback. And I think this is really timely because it's a timely opportunity for effective teaching, as the slide says, but also because uh, we want to be better, uh, more effective teachers, whether it's online or in, uh, in person. And so we're going to talk about ways that you are able to do that. And we're going to use the force like Yoda here in order to make that happen. So first up. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as was already stated, I'm a faculty member with previous roles, but right now I just teach human development and psychology uh, at a few different colleges. And there on the right is my little doggy, Bella. That's us at the um, the Learn and Safari for in Long Beach uh, with the at the conference there. Um, okay, so first up, we have our poll question, and this is just by. Uh, a raise of hands or a by using the emo, uh, uh, the reaction tool in uh, Zoom, uh, we'd like to know, do you already utilize some type of student self-assessment, informal feedback and or course survey? I see some thumbs up. I see some sad face. Oh, okay. I see a hand up. Thank you for that. Okay. So some of you look like you have some experiences while other of you seem to be looking for more opportunities to learn. So you're in the right place. All right. Um, how about number two, for those who do use some of these elements, how comfortable are you using these in your course? Give me a thumbs up or maybe like a thumbs down if you're not entirely comfortable. Okay, we got some thumbs up, I see. Okay, so um, there we go, we got some more. So I'm gonna go into explaining why we use these elements, how you can become more familiar with them, and I'm gonna give you some examples as well. We'll also have time for some breakout rooms, uh, which hopefully will give you opportunity to discuss with your peers some good strategies for implementation. I think implementation from these webinars is really what we're all looking for. So as the screen says here, our learning objectives for this webinar are to assess your own online courses for opportunities to capture student feedback. Uh, we're going to define two types of self-assessments that could improve course effectiveness. And we're going to incorporate course survey questions and timely use of their on, in your online courses, and you'll learn how to do that as well. 
All right. Oh, and just so you know, there are two opportunities for questions and I'll let you know when those are. Otherwise you can put your Q&A question in the Q&A section of the chat. All right. The what, why, when, how, and where of student feedback. Let's get into it. So we have three different types that we're going to be discussing. The first type is called self-assessments. This is basically an opportunity for students to check their own understanding without being penalized. That's the key factor there. Uh, you know, sometimes when we look at a Canvas course, we are uh, looking at everything as something that has to have points and something that will be graded and docked. And that's what we kind of want to get away from. The self-assessment is an opportunity for students to check their own understanding without being penalized. So non-punitive grade checks, non-punitive knowledge checks. That's what we're referring to when we're talking about self-assessments. So if you were like me and you were looking at like the OEI rubric and it has self-assessment on there and you were confused because self-assessments are, you would think they are something that is an assignment that the student has to turn in. I think I had like 10 self-assessments in my, in my human development class and it was all about students' goals and students' time management and they were assessing their self on those things. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about, again, non-punitive ways of checking in that students can do and utilize to make sure that they know the information they're supposed to be learning along the way, and then make sure they know what their grade is along the way as well. So that's very in important to have those. The second um, area here is informal feedback. This is an opportunity for instructors to receive just-in-time feedback about the course flow and be about the course effectiveness, about what's working great, about what could be improved. This is unplanned, really, hopefully tailored feedback that is useful that can then be um, instituted within that course or maybe the next course that uh, the faculty member teaches based on when they get this informal feedback. The third area is course surveys. This is a pre-planned opportunity for feedback, looking at information to approve the effectiveness of your course, and I'll show you where those types of things can go. All right, next, the why. Why do we provide self-assessments? Well, I mean, students need a chance to check in and see if they understand what we're talking about, right? Um, in an on-ground in-person class, we do this in a number of different ways, and we have to think about how can we structure our online classes to be able to provide those same opportunities. So um, in an on-ground class, you know, you could just ask your students, did you get that? Uh, does that make sense? You know, you could just check in right after the point where you've delivered that information. You give them the information, you check right in for understanding, right? Uh, and so we have to think about how can we do that in the online modality as well. And then next, why do we ask for course feedback? Well, you know, as much as we try as faculty to make our courses very streamlined and concise and clear and organized in Canvas. It's just not always received that way. And so we don't always know what works best unless we ask. And then we're getting that feedback and that becomes really useful. All right, next up we have the when. We wanna think about when should we include self-assessments? Again, those are the non-punitive um, opportunities to have students check their knowledge and also to have students check their grade. And I and I bring up checking the grade because sometimes we are looking at um, different alternative, more equitable, decolonized ways of grading. And um, those could look like a lot of different things. And if we ever change the way we're grading, we definitely want to provide students with the opportunity to check their grade and understand what it looks like. For example, in my class, I use contract grading. Um, and so it could be a little jarring in the beginning of the semester for students who've never experienced it. And so I have several grade check opportunities for them to see so that I can see if they know how to check their grade and where feedback is and whatnot. So that's one of the reasons why we would have grade checks. Of course, you can have them in traditional grading as well. They're wonderful opportunities to get feedback from your students about how they think they're doing in your class. I know we've all had a student that gets to the end of the semester is like, what? I didn't know I had a not passing grade. And, you know, even though we've emailed, we've left comments, we've tried to check in, you know, sometimes there's a disconnect and students aren't getting those notifications, right? So we want to structure our classes so that they can. So with a knowledge check being um, an opportunity for a self-assessment, it's best to do this directly 
after the point of knowledge acquisition. So in the same way we would in an on-ground in-person class, we give a portion of our lecture or we give an assignment, we give a, a video resource, a handout. We, we are introducing a concept and then boom, you want to check for understanding. So this is different than a quiz that checks that they have understanding on a lot of different things that have been introduced. This is rather at the point of, of need, as we say in at one, at the point of need. And that is important because by the time the student gets through all of the content pages in the discussion, having the check on the recap page sometimes is too far removed and they haven't, they've already forgotten some of that information. So what I mean is directly on a Canvas page right after whatever it is you're trying to deliver to the student, that would be the best place for a knowledge check self-assessment that is, again, non-punitive. So I'm going to show you what that could look like in a few seconds. Lastly, over here, we have when should we ask for course feedback? Uh, this is important because you want to, I like to be able to implement changes within the course, the live course that I'm getting the feedback for. So I ask for feedback in my welcome unit. And I actually ask for feedback at the end of every unit in the recap, my anonymous survey, that's where I've put it. Uh, in the CBC OEI course uh, sample on in Commons, they have it positioned in the mid semester and at the end of the semester. There's no real wrong way to do that. Um, it's just what works best for you and your course and your students, right? And I'll show you some examples of that in just a moment as well. So when do we utilize informal feedback? Again, informal feedback is so great, but it's impromptu. It's no set time. It could be through a random you know, survey at the end of a unit. It could be in an email. It could be through comments. Um, I always like my early birds for this. My early birds are the students that get on first to, our, to my Canvas course. And when something's not working right, they email me right away and say, I clicked on this and it's not working. It's not showing up. And so those students provide me impromptu feedback about what's not working and I'm able to then go fix it. And the rest of my students are none the wiser and they think I'm just a stellar Canvas operator. Uh, but again, informal feedback is just that. It's informal, it's impromptu, there's no set time for that. All right, let's go on to our next slide here and we're gonna show you some examples. So let me share my other screen here. Let me see, new share. And this is desktop two. Okay, so for our first area here, this is a Canvas quiz and this is a knowledge check opportunity. And I'm showing you that the quiz can be used as an ungraded survey. That is what's, what are the, the point that I'm trying to make. Ungraded surveys are very interesting. They're not worth points. So if you're thinking of having a content page and an ungraded survey right afterwards, that ungraded survey could ask questions based on what's on that content page. Now, some folks have said, well, I would rather have the content in the instructions area of the ungraded survey, and that way your lecture page or your content page now becomes something that has a to-do date, and the students are going to be submitting something on that page, and so they're not missing it. We all know that students will go right to the discussion or the assignment or something that has a due date and they will miss our content pages. So some people like to have their content pages be an assignment, something that the students have to submit something for. So it gives them that expectation that you have to do something on this page. I know some folks have done to do, they'll set a to do date for a content page, but if there's nothing that the student actually has to do, they will sometimes not even look at that page. So again, this is an ungraded survey. And so when you're making your quiz, you could use this dropdown to select ungraded survey. And that means it's no points. It also means it's not going to show up in speed grader in um, the syllabus page and as uh, an assignment because it's an ungraded survey. It doesn't count against the student. Students can take it as many times as they would like if you set it up that way. And the same thing goes for practice quiz. 
practice quiz, same thing. It is not going to show up in your speed grader and whatnot. Again, it's something that the students can take as many times as they need to, to see that they're getting the right answer. I hope that makes sense. The second thing that's really important about this is that when you are um, giving the student the question, there's an opportunity for direct feedback. So um, if you are putting in your correct answer, obviously, and your wrong answers, you can drop down that uh, menu and put in directive feedback so that students can know right away they got the answer wrong and here's why. And so if you know that maybe when you give your lecture on ground, that some students generally mistake certain concepts for other concepts, this is where you could address that. You could have your ungraded survey, you could have the options that are popular, popularly that get mixed up, and then provide feedback, directive feedback right at the end that says, well, actually, this is this X, Y, and Z concept. You can review this on the content page above or previously in Canvas uh, if you need more information about that. So you're directing them back to the content that they should have learned the first time, right? So some folks really like developing these questions in this way because it's non-punitive. It is. Uh, it has a to-do date and um, students are able to complete it as an, as an assignment. The next uh, way that we can think about giving a question and an answer without making an assignment, this would be tabs. And I'm gonna show you on this first tab would be where you could have your question. And I'm gonna show you on the second tab is where you would have your answer. I've moved away from having this cute little button, which I was so proud of, because it, the, the code doesn't show up on a cell phone. And so I was like, well, if it's not showing up on a cell phone, I'm gonna move away from that. So I no longer use this model, but I still use a question on tab one and then the answer on tab two. And that would be, again, at the time of need. So my content page would have my, um, whatever I'm trying to deliver to my students, whether it be a PowerPoint, a handout, a concept, a video, and then boom, I could have tabs. Tab one with a question and they don't see the answer. So that's that metacognitive opportunity for them to remember what they're supposed to recall. And then they click on tab two and now they have the answer and they say, oh yeah, I did get that. I got that right. You know, they get that, um, that uh, confirmation that they did learn what they were supposed to learn. Back in the day, I had my tabs like this on my recap. This is my recap page. I've moved away from that because I think it's better to put it at the time of need right on that content page. And that way students get the information. If they didn't, they don't have to go looking at a different page for the information that they're supposed to review. It'll be right above um, on the content page. Next up, we have um, a Google form. So this would be like a lecture page for an online class. Um, again, I have like a video and I have some text and then you could insert a sample, this is my sample, you could insert a Google form or a Microsoft form as well. And the thing about this is if you make your forms a quiz, there's an opportunity to provide feedback. So if I select option four, it's the wrong answer. And then you click view score, it pops open and boom, this is the correct answer. And that's where you could provide feedback. Go back and review this section of our assignment, of our lecture, X, Y, and Z. And now you're covering, giving them feedback about something that they didn't, didn't quite learn completely. And they're getting that uh, self-assessment, non-punitive check. Same thing is true with a... Um, Microsoft form. And they can, again, take that assessment once again, once over. Uh, this does work on a cell phone and it does work on a tablet as well. So they're getting an equitized experience no matter their device. So I think that's important. All right. Um, next up, we have a open-ended questions that we can ask. This is a quiz um, and I am asking them, how do they feel about their learning? Uh, this is that metacognitive opportunity to think with the students about their grade. So this is moving from the knowledge check to a grade check, still under the category of self-assessments. Uh, and these are open-ended questions. I used knowledge, uh, I used grade tracking uh, in terms of grade bundling. I'm asking them, do you understand how you do your grade bundle? And then lastly, I'm asking them, 
is there anything that you can do to improve your time management, et cetera? Or is there anything I can do to improve the class course flow? So now I've matched or I've, I've added in a grade check, which is their metacognitive opportunity for self-assessment. And then I've added in a feedback for me. It's timely, it's planned, right? They have to answer the question and I'm able to see if there's anything I can do better um, in the course. So my grade checks are twice before the midterm and twice before the final. And that's because I want students to know how to find the information that they're trying to get, which is usually feedback, um, because for when you do contract grading, they can resubmit. So they need the feedback, they need to know where it's at, and they need to be able to resubmit. One of the things that I did in the second grade check for this course is I added a screenshot of where feedback is. Because students, as try as I might, Students, you know, say they know where feedback is and then they don't. And so I'm always answering the same question over and over. So within the quiz, uh, the grade check, I provide this image. Um, I'm pointing to right where it is. I'm explaining exactly where to find feedback. And that really sh uh, shut down a lot of those questions about where feedback was because they see this, they see this as a quiz, even though it's a grade check and they know they have to do it. So they do it. And now I'm able to determine who knows where feedback is, who didn't do their grade check, and I'm able to reach out to those students in order to, you know, kind of, you know, push them along, say, hey, finish this, you know, get your work in, know where feedback is, in include that feedback moving forward, and now I have more information as to who's struggling and who's doing really well in the course. Um, so that is just one way to do a grade check. The other way here is text entry. So you could do a text entry box uh, assignment, zero points. Again, we're not trying to make our grade check self-assessment punitive. It's just an opportunity to get them to look at their grades page, look at your feedback, understand your grading structure and whatnot, and submit any questions that they have for you or feedback for you. One of the things that I found is that really in my on-ground class, I would ask my students, because I teach in a computer lab, I would ask them, you know, did you check your grade page? And they were like, oh no, oh, I'm afraid. I don't, I don't want to check my grades page. I don't want to see my bad grades. And I'm like, that's the worst thing you could do because you, in order to get your grade up, you have to know what your grade is. So again, and even in my on-ground classes, I had them do the same assignment. So it really did help with grade bundling for explaining grade bundling, having students check their assignments and knowing if they're on track or not, knowing if they understand where the feedback is and whatnot. And again, it is not punitive. Uh, also, I, I think you could do other tasks the same way. If there's any task that you want your students to do without changing your grading structure, if you use points, you could create a task to complete, make it a text box entry and, and start asking them, do you know where tutoring is? Did you go see a tutor? Like, did you go to any student services, right? Again, an opportunity to help them along with whatever it is they need help with in your class without it being punitive. That could also be, you know, another type of self-assessment there. So that is a little bit on um, grade checks, knowledge, uh, assess, knowledge checks, self-assessments. Let's move on to where we could put these surveys. For a survey, I like to put my survey in the module recap, uh, in my welcome module. A lot of times uh, faculty have told me that they find it beneficial to also include in their welcome module an opportunity to get sensitive information from students. So your survey can also be, um, is there anything else you wanna tell me? Um, you know, anything you would like to disclose, right? That's private, that wouldn't be discussed in a discussion with your fellow students. Um, preferences for text only feedback, if we do give audio or visual feedback. Uh, that would be another option, as well as what's the last one? Um, oh, it, it could a survey could be an opportunity for tasks to complete. One of the surveys I used to use was for notifications because I would tell my students update your notifications, and you know they wouldn't. So I put in a Google form that said, "Did you update your notifications? Yes, no, and then I need help with this." And so then I would contact the students that first, you know, two or three, four days who filled out the form and said they needed help. And then I would re-explain the importance of it. And I would show them again, the instructions on how to change their notifications for receiving you know, instant emails 
when I leave feedback. And then if they wanted to change their email to a personal email outside of their school email as well, I would let them know how to do that. So again, surveys can be opportunities to do any type of task, you know, um, non-punitive, of course, and then to get some interesting feedback right away. So like I said, I have my uh, module recap. It has a opportunity for anonymous feedback. And it really, a lot of, I get a lot of responses in the welcome unit. They usually say, oh, it's this great. It's really organized, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes they ask me questions there, but I also leave a note that says, you know, I, this is anonymous. I can't respond to your question. So if you have a question, leave it in the, the Q and A chat or just email me. Or sometimes um, they give, I give them my Google voice and they can just text me their question. Um, so there's that. But this is the same anonymous feedback survey that I have uh, placed after my units. So what that means is we have our first unit and boom, I have a unit recap right here as well. And it's the same form. So this is unit recap and boom, same form. So as you could imagine, after the first week or two, um, I get less anonymous feedback. Um, and that's I'm fine with that. Usually they the students have are knowing that they can contact me by email or by voice uh, text and let me know if something's wrong or if or if, even if they like what's going on in the class. Sometimes there's students all throughout the semester, they'll be filling this out every unit and I'm fine with that. It's usually all good feedback anyways. So um, over time, I have you know used the feedback from this survey uh, to improve the effectiveness of really all my courses because what works in one class tends to work in another class as well. So there's that. Um, and then next up here, let's take a little moment for some questions because I've been talking for a bit. So let me reshare my PowerPoint. Or actually, do you have any questions that I can answer for you? I might have to show you some of the things over again. So let me just open it up. Is it switching, yeah. Any questions? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm seeing a couple in the chat. Mm -hmm. I know that in the chat, Allison had a question about how to do tabs, and I pasted a link there. In the Q and A, Paley, I don't know if I pronounced your name right, has a couple of ones. The first one from 412 says, "How would you do this with a fully online class?" I'm not sure if she can, un if they can unmute and give us some context. Yeah, everything that I've shown right now is are all things I do in my online course. So yeah, I would need more context. Okay. And I think the follow-up was directly after the point of knowledge acquisition for a fully online class. I guess it's about timing. Okay, and yeah. And you would so, deploy that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me see if I can find it. So this one, for example, this is my lecture page. You guys can still see my page, right? Okay, good. I got so this is my lecture page. I have my my learning objectives there. And then I have my, my questions that I'm going to ask them on the discussion page. I put them there so that they know what they're gonna be asked. I have my content. And again, right after the, the content is where you can put your Google form, your Microsoft Office form, if you wanna use that. If you would rather use tabs, you can, like right here where this form is, is where you could put a tab such as this, tab one, tab two, question, answer. So this is a perfect opportunity to do at the time of need, right when you're giving them the, the tidbit that you're trying to get them to learn, they can check in with it, um, in with their own knowledge. Like, did I get that? Yes. Let me answer this question. I got it. It could be just one or two questions. It doesn't have to be like a whole quiz or something like that. Um, and I've seen H5P be used this way too, but I steer clear of H5P because it's not all accessible. And so if anybody's familiar with that, it's the same concept on the actual page that you are actually wanting them to get the knowledge from on that page. That's where you could insert your knowledge check. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you so much for explaining that. Um, my other question is, how do you embed this Google form onto your Canvas? Because I've not done that before. I, I wasn't even aware that you could do that. Okay. So let me pop open a new window right here. Where's my mouse? Boop, 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 boop. So this is my Google form. And in case I do have a hyperlink later on with all these steps, so you don't have to take notes necessarily. But when you have a Google form that you want to make a quiz under the settings tab, you go to make this a quiz and then boop, that toggles on. 
that gives you a couple more features inside of Google Forms. You have the answer key now option that pops up here after you toggle on quizzes. And when you click on that, you that's where you select your appropriate answer. And that's where you give feedback for correct or incorrect answers. After you do that and save it, when you go to send in the top right hand corner, you would click on the open carrot end carrot. That is the code. That's the embed code. Once you copy that, you would go to the page in question, go to edit on the top right hand side, opens your rich content editor, and wherever you want this code to be, let's say I wanted it right here, I would place my cursor where I might desire the code. I would go in the ribbon to, on the top right to the embed cloud image, mm -hmm. and you paste the code here, click submit, and then it pops up. Excellent. And can I ask you, um, when the students um, answer that, does it tally all the responses and send it to your email, your Gmail, or does it get Great collected question. on campus? If, if you want the information in that way, it, it would just stay right here in responses. This is me clicking on my own quiz a few times. You would get the information this way. Once it goes to, I want to say over a couple hundred responses, you can open it in a sheet, like a Excel sheet. This is Google Sheets. And then if you want a email response for everybody who responds, if that's what you want, you're into, <laughs> you can click right here and click get email notification for new responses. I'm not, I don't do that for knowledge checks that are deep into my class. I only do that one for, did you select your notifications? <laughs> because I'm not trying to get emails with everybody checking their knowledge, yeah. but when I use the Google form as an opportunity to check, did you do what I told you to do? And I need to know if you really did or not, then I, I do, I have them, send me an email or whatnot, or I could always just make it in my calendar to do that first, like second or third day, go check my Google sheet for okay. this response to this form. Make sense? Yes, yes, thank yeah. you. We did have another question from Allison that said that she had a similar question. How do we create these check-in surveys other than using the quiz function in Canvas? I'm not sure if the, the point about the Google Forms addresses that, or there are other methods that you were probably perhaps going to touch on later on as well. Okay, so for, um, where is it? Da, 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 da. So this, that, not that one, just getting is it this one. This is not a quiz. This is an assignment. So if you don't like, if your question is, how do you get embedded content onto a page in Canvas without using quizzes, that would be Forms. Google Forms, Office Form, uh, Microsoft Office Forms. If your question is, I don't like quizzes, how can I do a, a knowledge check or a grade check? You can use assignments. And right here down at the bottom, you'll see this is a text entry assignment. So it's not a quiz, it's a text entry assignment. And they're gonna have a free box, like a open-ended essay type question box when they go to submit this assignment. I've given them the questions to answer right here. Do you understand how to track your grade? Do you know where feedback is? Are you resubmitting any of your work to earn a complete? Because they can do that in my class. Is there anything else you need to be successful? Is there anything that the professor can do to assist you? So again, this is not a quiz because I know everybody does not like quizzes. I don't really like quizzes that much, but text entry is another option. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Um, so I guess what I wanted to clarify is I'm I've never been very comfortable with Google, like Google Docs. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if the Google survey would be the same situation for me. So I was, I guess I would be, I guess I'm questioning as far as different methods of creating these feedback type um, surveys, you mm -hmm. could either, if I didn't want to use a Google Doc type thing, I could either do um, an ungraded assignment with an open-ended text box or a quiz and create it as a practice, either a practice quiz or an ungraded quiz. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and for anybody who came late, just if you do practice uh, quiz or ungraded quiz. Let me get back over here to it. If you do ungraded survey or practice quiz, it does not show up in speed grader. Uh, so do not be alarmed by that. It's a practice opportunity for students. You know, um, 
it's it's technically you know ungraded in that way. It's non-punitive, so it does not show up in speed grader, et cetera. As the instructor, though, how do you see their um, responses if it's not in speed grader? Um, you could go. You could always go up to your quizzes, and then on the right hand side, it should show up as something that you can get into and see the responses. Um, yes, that is, uh, that is what my brain is telling me. <laughs> this is. Let's see. Mm. Oh, there is a. Let me before I say that. Let me. Okay, I know what it is. When you have students who complete it, well, you can go to the quizzes page, you can go to moderate the quiz, and then it brings up the analytics for the quiz. And then there's a way to, to um, pull down the information. I believe you pull it out into an Excel spreadsheet, but it's not really for, it's not really like an assignment that you're gonna be looking at. It's really an opportunity just for students to be trying the information out and, cause it's a quiz question. so picking a b c and d etc it's not something that they're really going to be putting any text into if you're putting text into it that you want to switch that over to a text entry assignment these opportunities are really multiple choice type things uh, that you don't really need to look at necessarily because it's just a knowledge check they're practicing their knowledge etc it's not something you're grading so it's really not something you're monitoring does that make sense yeah, that makes total sense. Right, yeah. definitely. If it's something you're going to be monitoring, you're going to want to do text entry or or uh, the Google form. You know, it's going to put that out into a, a spreadsheet for you quite easily, um, and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And All so right. she just put a link in chat for the Canvas guide for reviewing survey results. Yes. Thank you, Sochi. <laughs> Um, okay. All right. Are there any other questions before you guys get into your breakout rooms? Okay. So, um, let me open the rooms. It looks like we have, okay. Let me actually, let me recreate these to be, um, Okay. Not including us, we have about 57 participants. So thinking yes. about 10 breakout rooms should be sufficient. That's exactly what I did. All right. So you guys should see the breakout rooms on your screen. You should be able to join. If you have any questions, let me know. And I can always assign you to a room if you're having trouble. Oh, they're jumping already. Let me put the break. We should just go ahead and join it as soon as we see it on our screen. Yes. I'm going to put the breakout question in the chat for to broadcast the message to everybody. Sorry about that. We broadcast this, there we go. And we have, let me put this in the broadcast message as well. Um, I would say, I'll check back in in 12 minutes, minutes. There we go. All right. If you guys are having trouble, just let us know. Should we pause the recording while they're in breakout rooms? That would be great. Looks like room nine, nobody else has joined with Alex. And so thank you very much for that. Let Can you put that room. on the chat just in case we need to contact you for the credit? We will we'll mention it at the end. That'll be oh, part of our you. closing. Thank you so much. All right. So Thank you for participating in your breakout rooms. We were popping in and out of those and we heard some really good conversations. So we would like to use this time to share what you guys are thinking about incorporating and, and then answer any more questions you have about what that might look like. So first of all, we have self-assessments. So that's again, the knowledge check and the grade check, non-punitive. So who would like to share out about what they think they might be able to incorporate into their class? I could share. Do you want me to share? Yeah. Um, so I um, I currently have a end of course anonymous survey, mm -hmm. and I assume when you I assume all of these are anonymous, um, except for except for maybe the informal feedback could come back to you with the person, right? Mm -hmm. they can come, right. And same with I mean I guess you could make them non anonymous, but anyway I have an end of course 
anonymous survey. And of course, I understand that it would be a very good idea to have an, a midterm or even more than one for a survey. So I'm always about to create one, but I run out of time and things get overwhelming. And so I don't, but that is certainly something I'd like to add um, more opportunities for students to um, provide me with feedback mm -hmm. uh, during the course. And so either informal as well as a midterm course survey. Um, and then the other thing we were talking about in our breakout room is just like sort of minor little details. And one of them for me is that so many of the students don't have their notifications set. And so I, you know, am always checking in and saying, well, um, you didn't submit this assignment. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll email through Canvas and say, you know, write a message to all of them who did not submit something and invite them to do so and then they don't get back to me and then when they come back around let's say two weeks later and say I missed that assignment I say well I already asked you and you didn't respond mm -hmm. and then they it turns out they don't have their notifications set so right. that's something I would like to um, be more proactive about and get them into that with um, but I do have one quick question Yes. You mentioned that you, if you if you do these, you could put them on the student to do list. Yes. Even though they're not worth any points. Yes. But so will that kind of um, on the Canvas page, if you're using Canvas, will that give the students sort of a heads up, like, hey, this is something you should check out, because otherwise, how are you going to reach these people that don't have their notifications set? Right. Let me go back to sharing my screen here and just go over one thing. Um, oh, in Commons, you know, Commons is off to the left-hand side of your guys' screens in Canvas. You should be able to search for the CBC OEI course template. If you don't want to make your midterm and your final survey, they have a survey created in their, their course for you, and you could implement that. So that's always free, you know, for you guys. Um, okay. So Regarding, let me get a content page here. Let me get out of this and let me get a content page of, is this a sandbox? This is a sandbox. Okay. And this is a page. All right. Oh, this already has a to-do. Okay. So this is a content page. You see how it says pages. That's how you know Jasmine, it's a content page. Sorry, yes. you're not, you're, you're sharing your um oh, PowerPoint. I could have, oh, I didn't click share, share. Are you guys seeing this page now? Okay, let me let me go back to what I was saying before about comments. In comments, on the left-hand side of your screen, you have that comments link. And if you type in CBC OEI course template, I believe it's called CBC OEI course template. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but they have a course template created for you and you can pull out the midterm and the final survey. Uh, so you don't have to create your own surveys for that reason. Um, okay, so what I was trying to say before I misspoke there for a second. Okay, so this is a Canvas page, and you'll see here it says to do. It has a to do date, although there is nothing exactly for them to do on this page. However, if you put a Google form on the page, they can submit their form saying they did the thing they were supposed to do. So there's that option if you like. When you, in order to get this, you click on edit in the top right hand side. When you scroll down, you will be able to see the checkbox. And remember, this is a content page, so it's not an assignment page. But in every content page, you have this box that says add to students to do. That means it will show up on their to-do list on the right-hand side of the canvas, it will show up on their um, syllabus page, and it will show up on the calendar page. And so you know those are where they look to say, what am I supposed to do, right? And so they click on that and it could be a task. I like, well, if I have a task for them to complete, I call it a task to complete. I'll make it a content page. I'll give it a to-do. If I really need to double check that they did it, I will put a little Google form and then it says, yes, I did this. Click yes or click no, or I need more help. Boom. And then I'm able to get that information. Um, if I wanted to do it uh, a different way, well, I mean, that's the best way that I know how to do it. So, Yeah. Um, if you wanted to make it a quiz where it's just like, yes or no, I did this thing, they're going to get docked if you say no. So that's the reason why I do a Google form embedded on the Canvas page. 
And then I can look up the spreadsheet if I want to see if somebody didn't do it and check back in with them. So that, does that answer your question? So I guess, so it sounds like if you put add to student to do, that's really your only way to really get, gain their attention to do it. Yes. And I, the only other thing I can think of is something I do for the um, meet and greet intros that I want them to do to check in is I actually, um, it says zero on the Canvas page, but they get five extra credit points, even though it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's sort of like an incentive because who doesn't want the five points? Right, right. So, so you could add some, a few tiny little points for people who actually fill out your surveys. Although the, hmm, I don't know if you can do it on anonymous ones because you wouldn't have any way to, if you knew who they were, then that takes the anonymous anonymity yeah. out of it right 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 so, uh, the only other way that I know of which I have done in the past but I will say can get a little frustrating for students because they are so used to just clicking on to do or their syllabus or their calendar page I have made it so that my mo in my module page that they have to complete a few things sequentially and you know there's ways to do that with prerequisites in the modules and that's the only other way that i know to lock it down so they have to do something before the next thing um some classes i used to have it like that for in my entire class and eventually i was just like we're gonna only do it for the welcome module and module one and that way i know that they know that's the structure and it's on them afterwards if they don't want to click on all the things however i have found that the my newest classes that i've created Adding the lecture content to the to-do list makes them look at it. You know, I got more responses that indicate they're looking at it uh, in my assignments, whether it was a discussion or a self-assessment, like, uh, you know, text box submission, uh, it seemed to work. So there's that. Okay. Now, one quick thing, this might sound totally naive, but if I create assignments for my students and quizzes, if I don't put to-do and they're worth, let's say, 20 points, or any number of points, do they still show up on their Canvas page as something they need to do? If it's graded, yes. Yeah. If it is a practice quiz or an ungraded survey, then, oh wait, you're asking if it shows up on the student's to-do list. Yes. Yeah, like, yeah. so if I don't place, if I don't check off the to-do box, but it's a it's a serious assignment that's, you know, yeah. worth points, that if automatically shows up on their little, like, yeah, Another all of the calendars. quiz types, all of the quiz types do show up for students on their to-do list. Yeah. And and assignments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you have it, with quizzes, you with quizzes, you have the date at the bottom. So there is no need to select to do. They already come with the functionality of the date. Right. The due date. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, so anybody else care to share what they discussed for self-assessments or have a question about the knowledge check or the grade checks? We want to hear some good ideas or answer some questions. No, nobody else cares to share? Okay, maybe you're just percolating and thinking. We can move on to informal feedback. Was there any discussion that you guys had about capturing informal feedback um, in, in a timely way? All righty, moving on, course surveys. Is there any discussion you guys had about course surveys? Hello, this is Deborah. Um, yes. So I mentioned that um, I already implement like a, like a, I, at the beginning, I have a discussion where I try to, I, I teach 3D modeling. And so right. at the beginning, I have a discussion where I ask what people's expectations and skills that are. Mm -hmm. And uh, a reason I ask that is because um, with my topic, sometimes people can download <laughs> stuff and turn it in. So I, okay. I want to get perspective of, oh, do you know another 3D program and you're just really good and you're learning this program? Or is it suspicious that you're really good? And then at the end of the uh, class, I ask for feedback, which I've already, uh, I started teaching in the summer. And so I've already implemented a couple times where I'll add more text um, for people to read on the modules or mm -hmm. um, 
simply they asked uh I teach hybrid and so I only have an hour zoom and they they wanted to see their classmates work and I'm like well I'm already struggling teaching in an hour so all right 50 points extra credit 10 10 assignments five points each you can share your work and hopefully that encourages people to share but I can't like make people share and I can't I don't have time in my zoom to share class work so I is trying trying to get people to do more with what the previous students asked um, within the bounds of what I'm capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And so are you, is your question, I, did, I didn't understand the question. Are you saying that you want to know how to do that better or how, how to get students? We to, examples. Yes, but so. so are you saying that you, because you give the survey and you ha you want students to look at each other's work, are you implementing the survey in order to do that or? I, I guess was, I, was, I was just I thought you were asking people to share how they're implementing course surveys. Okay. I uh, yes, I did hear that you you said that you do have the course survey, but then I, I also I heard you. Have, I, sorry, I misunderstood. I, I didn't have a question. I thought we were showing sharing examples how we used to do it in our yes. Course. I just also heard that you said that you were struggling to get students to look at each other's work, and so I was trying to figure out a solution for that. But if that's not what, okay. what you, yeah, if that's not what you were asking for, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, I didn't. I was kind of um, I kind of gave up so I didn't, I didn't even think to think of a solution for that but if you have an, if you have an example of a solution for that yet I think if you're trying to get students to look at each other's work I've had like uh, in my online classes I've had oral presentations that they have to submit to a discussion and then they're required to give a peer response and or they're required for a peer review and this the peer review is structured so that would look like you know, an opportunity for students to get feedback from one another guided feedback questions not simply, Tell tell us what you liked about your your fellow present uh, students presentation because they're gonna say it was great, right? But if you have guided like uh, requirements, like was there this requirement this that I'm requiring in the rubric, right? And maybe three or four requirements that you know you're gonna be grading anyways. Now the students are looking at each other's components and they're giving feedback about what could be stronger and better. At the same time, they're understanding the assignment better themselves and then their work gets better. So if you're looking for a way to structure peer-to-peer -peer feedback, I think a peer review would could be your solution. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, were there any other questions or really good ideas that you guys had to utilize the information we've discussed? Uh, Jasmine, I have a question. Um, I always do mid-course surveys. Yes. However, every three years for my um, faculty evaluation, I'm required to submit um, student evaluations. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that students will find it confusing to have completed a mid-course survey. And then I'm going to ask for a formal student evaluation, you know, and, you know, my faculty evaluation depends on that uh, student evaluation. Right. So what would you suggest in that case is the best practice? Um, can you explain your process for uh, getting your faculty evaluation survey into your shell? Because I know schools uh, do it differently. It, it's a district link that they okay. have to click on. Okay. I think that as long as your survey that you are giving uh, midway or at the end or after every unit, uh, if that is is labeled as this is an anonymous survey that uh, the only, only the faculty, only my the faculty member will be seeing it. This is used to incorporate your feedback into the class and make it a better learning experience for you. Um, this You'll have another opportunity at the end of the semester to do this, da, 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 right? So you're giving them that context. And then if you shoot out an email or if you put in an announcement or if we put it in the module um, that, you know, this is a, you know, a survey regarding my own formal faculty evaluation that the district provides and requires, now they're understanding that these two things are separate and I and I can still give them this feedback and the district will see it and the faculty member sees it and it's a formal process. Does that make sense? Problem is it's an eight week class and they're gonna have um, survey burnout. Okay, if that's the case, if you wanted multiple surveys that are anonymous, you could do weeks for uh, weeks two like and week two could really be how are you really doing if if you want it to be an anonymous like open-ended anonymous you could put that there but it could also be a grade check and where you follow up with the how are you doing what else could be done better in this class to to help you along etc and then you could have your final in week eight and that way if your faculty evaluation happens around week six week five they're not being bombarded okay thank you you're welcome 
All right. Are there any other questions? I did leave quite a bit of time for individualized questions. So that is what this time is for. Is there anybody else that cares to share? I have another question, okay. which it sounds like you're sending out a lot of the material to all of us afterwards, as far yeah. as like a transcript and the PowerPoint slides. Um, but I was wondering if, if part of that material includes like kind of the how to the technical aspect, because I do know how to create the canvas um, surveys and assignments. I can do that. Mm -hmm. But if there's any other technical things that you, I, I missed, like I said, the first 10 minutes. So okay. I sort of walked in and you, and you were moving pretty quickly and I was getting the point and the idea and the purpose, but I just like, I got lost on the technical aspects of what to do. Yes. So yes, you are going to be getting the slides and the, the recording, I believe. Um, and in the, the, one of the last slides that I have, I have a link that shows how to do the Google form because the uh, I, I went over how to get the Google form into Canvas. I'm not sure if you were here for that portion or not, but there are steps on how to do that in one of my last slides. The other information in terms of technicality, um, I hadn't, uh, outside of creating quizzes and, and Canvas pages, I hadn't included any other resources on how to create a quiz or a Canvas page. Does oh, okay. So it's only the Google thing that was tripping me up. And I don't really like Google anyway. So, I mean, I like Google, but I yeah. just don't like their, uh, their, their forms. So that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Everything that you could do with Google, you can do, I would say, if you don't want an assignment, you could do it with a tab. So you could have two tabs. Um, and on the first tab, you would have your question on the second tab, you would have your answer. So in this, it would achieve the same task of the knowledge check right at the point of need without an assignment and without it being punitive. Um, so cheat, is there a cheat sheet on tabs that we could provide with the resources that we send out? I don't know if that one has one of those. So I pasted one in the chat earlier. It wasn't specifically from an at one okay. site, but I'm sure that Sochi and I can probably dig up one that was developed by us. Okay. Yeah. I do know that some faculty are frustrated by tabs. And so if you are, don't worry, you don't have to use them. Um, you know, the forms or just Canvas itself is totally sufficient. And for those who don't like the forms and want to just Canvas and tabs, again, go right on ahead. Uh, on a cell phone, the tabs don't show up as tabs. They show up one under another. So that's, yeah. the, that's the only thing I don't like because the idea is that the answer is hidden to allow an opportunity for metacognition and recall. And that that kind of functionality goes away on a phone and, and a tablet with tabs. Yeah, tabs is just, just manipulating the HTML code to segment the page in such a way. But as Jasmine notes, on a mobile device, and I believe even the Canvas app, it just shows up as one really long page. Yeah. I I did a, a sort of a experiment, which I didn't end up publishing, but I created like this sort of like fun little quiz that it wasn't for points mm -hmm. and I had like I did what I did was I just made it like two separate canvas pages but I set it up so you had to go to the question page before you could get to the answer page mm -hmm. so it was sort of primitive but that was sort of one workaround that might work I don't know how it would show up on a cell phone but I would assume they would be able to go like here's the questions and then I yeah. flip to the answers yeah, I mean that sounds like it would be it would work just fine as long as it was a Canvas page. I have seen some some interesting code like like my little button that I showed earlier that when you click on it it opens up. I think schools that have um what is it called to for designing Canvas pages. It's a software that some schools purchase. I know we have it at Cerritos. Um I'm blanking on City it. Lab? Is it yeah, City, City Lab? Lab. Design, Design Plus. Design Plus. If your school has that then you have the option to do cute little buttons if you want to get that detailed into it. It is cool. There's drop down pop outs. But if you want to keep it simple, I feel like the simpler, the better for our students. Then if you use the methods that I've just given you, it would be the simplest option. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was looking for the buttons and I didn't I don't think I have that 
technical ability as far yeah, as don't worry just... don't stress yourself out don't yeah, worry about yeah, it yeah. students really like the easiest most simplest way to get the information right. as cool Thank as you. we might think it looks to do all the other things I have found over my 10 years that they, they really just want as simple as possible yeah um, all right, so let me share my my slides again, and it's just a summation of what we've been talking about. Um, so let me see here. This should be the right one. Oh, it's this one. Okay, we'll make this into presentation mode and move this out of the way. So um, again, in case you didn't want to take notes, the, everything that I discussed is here on our, on our wrap up. And it sounds like you guys are using these, these things uh, are going to use these things quite quite nicely. Again, the Canvas quiz worth no points as the ungraded survey practice quiz doesn't show up in the grade book. Non-Canvas assignment uh, can be a Q&A with the tabs, Google Form or Microsoft Office Form. This is the hyperlink I was discussing that has these steps on how to use the Google Form in case you're wondering. And the explanation pointing back to course content is very effective when the answer is wrong. It's directly at the time that the student is learning. And so they get that reinforcement without them having to go back and search for the information because it should be right on that page or the page right after. So there's that. The grade check. Uh, worth points or not. Um, some people have said, well, if it's not worth points, why would the students do it? And again, if it shows up on their to-do list, they instinctively will click on it to do it. And if it's not too long, too complicated, again, they'll read through it, click it, answer it. And now you have given them a metacognitive opportunity to see how they're doing in the class and explain, did you click on your grades page? Did you click on the assignment name? Did you know comments will be down on the right-hand side, right? That's what they need right away in the beginning of the course. So that way you're not giving them feedback in the sweet 16. And they're like, what do you mean you gave me feedback? I didn't see that. So that's one way that I navigate around that. And lastly, the open-ended questions. Um, you know, like I said, you can do this as text entry. You could even do it as complete incomplete. For some reason, when students see the little X or check mark in their grades page, they see the X and they know that's incomplete, they'll go back and do it. If something is worth five points and they only get three points for it, they sometimes they think, oh, I can't go back and redo that. That's the final grade. And then they're missing out on whatever it is they're supposed to be learning. So I like complete and complete. And you can use grade points with complete and complete. So even though it's worth five points, you can say incomplete and then they'll think to go back and do it, and then they can earn the complete five points. Um, I had a lot of students not going back and doing their peer responses, and so they would miss half of their discussion points for the entire class. And I, it would frustrate me, right? Because I'm like, it's an online class. You need to do your peer response. So I switched to complete and complete, and I kept my points, and it allowed them to mentally think, oh, I have something I need to go back and do. So there's that. Can you just explain what you mean by complete and complete? Yeah, as far as in, how you notate that. In when you create an assignment in Canvas and you scroll to the bottom, there's an option for points and there's an option for complete and complete. Let me see if I can find one here real quick. Assignment. Let me find one. Uh, here we go. Let me share my share this part of my screen. Oh wait, wrong page. Hold that thought, it's coming right up. Loading. There we go, okay. Share this one, this one, share. All right, you should be able to see my little journal uh, assignment here. And, oh, it's a discussion. Let me try one more time. <laughs> This is like one long beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me get my um, behavior tracking. Yeah, okay. So this is an assignment. It's not a discussion. If you go to edit when you're creating your assignments, down here, you have options for complete and complete. So whether or not you want it to be marked in this in the syllabus page for students as a check mark or as an X, if you want them to see those options, you have to choose complete and complete. 
keep in mind, you can still make it as many points as you want. So you don't have to get rid of your points if you're not ready to do that. Uh, but again, you can make it sh make the syllabus page or grades page show up as points or a letter grade or complete incomplete. Does that make sense? That makes total sense, except if you have only discussions that you want to do as far as that, because that's where I have the, mm -hmm. they have to do a response to mm -hmm. their classmates. So yeah. can you do Same. it in a discussion as well? Same thing. I uh, I want to say yes, because I think I did it that way. Yeah, let me click on one and we'll open it back up and it should be there. I'm, I'm vaguely remembering I've done that before. Uh, yeah, complete and complete. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. All right. So let me switch back to my other screen here. Do, 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 do. Is it this one? Share. All right. So um, last but not least, informal feedback, takeaways. Uh, students get an opportunity to improve the effectiveness of, uh, or you get an opportunity to improve the effectiveness of your course because you've gotten the informal feedback from your students. Um, so they're basically helping you solve problems or, or technical issues. Anything that's confusing, like if I if I get, I would say three questions about an assignment in a class of 30, I know there's 10 other people that have the question that didn't want to email me. And so if I get three questions about an assignment, I go back and I look at my instructions, like maybe I didn't explain that right, you know? So there's always that opportunity to go back and improve. Um, you could, again, can reassure students that they're on the right track. I say that because when I get feedback from their grade checks and I get, you know, there's super critical students that are really hard on themselves and they, they say, oh, I'm worried that I'm not going to, you know, maintain my grade. And I'm like, well, you have hundred percent, like you're doing good. It's like an opportunity for you to give them reassurance. Right. And then for those who are confused and who say, oh, I'm passing. I'm like, actually you're not, you know, you're, you're a little low. So let's do something to make sure you get those assignments in. Right. It's an opportunity for that check-in and doing all of, all of those things really decreases the anxiety for the students because they have more reassurance in what, when they're in what their quality of work is and what their grade is going to be. And then that they can contact you at any time and get the help that they need. So that's it for our um, webinar. Um, I believe that, yeah, the last slide here just mentions that this will be recorded, et cetera, and be provided to you. Uh, are there any last questions before all right, we wrap up? Yes. Can Brandon, because I logged in at 402, can Brandon explain again how to get professional development credit for this again? We, we will, after we finish wrapping up any other questions Jasmine has, that'll actually be part of our closing. We'll address that once we get past all okay. any, any specific content, specific questions. Yeah. Content, okay. sorry about that. Content questions before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I thank you for your time. I know we all have busy days, so I thank you for being here and being present. It's been a pleasure. All right, and just a couple of things to note before we wrap up. So as Jasmine said, we really appreciate you attending this webinar, especially at 4 p.m. I tend to be more of a late afternoon, evening person, but I know that's not everyone's speed. Now, once again, we're gonna ask that you take a look in the chat. So she dropped the survey in the chat for to complete. Lend to your question, this goes to that specifically. The survey will serve as your proof of attendance for that. At the very bottom of the survey, there should be a button that says, give me a copy of my responses it's not turned on by default so just make sure that you click that before you hit submit survey for most schools that seems to be sufficient in terms of showing proof of attendance if for some reason your institution is saying that that is not enough you can message us at support at cdc.edu which i'm about to drop into the chat our webinars are also on the Bishop Resource Center. I do believe there is a way to complete an external transcript for that as well. So maybe your institution might ask for that as well. We also hope that you attend some of our future and upcoming webinars. So Chi, if you can, can you please drop the link to our up, their up and coming webinars? We have plenty of webinars that are gonna be running through the entirety of spring. So this is just the first month of them. We're offering them all the way through early May. Lastly, the webinar recording, as well as associated slides, will be posted on that website 
hopefully sooner than later. Well, we ask that you please bear with us a little bit because we do want to make sure that the webinar is properly captioned and accessible to all parties. So we're trying to get them turned around within a week, but if it's a little later than that, don't freak out, it will be up there. So thank you again for attending and just your support of CVC and Not One. And I hope you all have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.